Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Demopoulos. I'm executive director of the National Hellenic Society. Uh, the NHS is uh, a foundation that was developed and created to preserve, celebrate, and pass on Hellenic heritage. And this is part of our NHS Talks Stories uh, session uh, that we do with, in collaboration with our very good friends in Chicago at the National Hellenic Museum uh, to preserve and pass on uh, the great Greek American story. And one of the wonderful things about being part of the NHS is, is getting to meet and become friends with amazing people. And I'm really privileged and blessed to, to call uh, our guest today, Dr. Chad Prodromos, a friend and an NHS member. And, and uh, Chad, it's great to see you, great to have you. And, and uh, Chad is a, 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 a world-class uh, orthopedic surgeon, the father of the ACL in many ways, the modern ACL. We'll get into that a little bit more. So, uh, I would be named, my real name in Greek is Athena Rodas, and, and uh, I found the name Art somewhere along the lines. My dad never ever called me Art uh, as long as I lived. So I've got to know first, Chad, what is Chadwick Prodromos in Greek, please? And so it's Konstantinos, and my middle name is Constantine, and my father was Constantine, and they called him Gus, and then he was encouraged to elongate it, so he grew up Gustav. So he, he grew up with a German name and uh, we had a cousin who was Constantine. They called him Chad. So they, so I, so they got Chad out of Constantine. This was, you know, this was the 1950s. Um, now it's cool to have ethnic names, then not so much. That's right. So tell us a little bit about your background, Chad, since this is a, a, a stories episode. Tell us a little bit about your mom and dad and your immigra their immigration story, basically. Sure. How, how you guys <laughs> came over and where you're from <laughs> in Greece. Yeah, so my, my paternal grandfather came over from uh, Smyrna. Now, Ismir, in about 1908, um, he married my father's mother, who was a young widow. Um, shortly thereafter, my father was born in 1913 uh, in Chicago. My <clears throat> mother's parents came from Kalamata and Medigalas in Misinia, um, also about 1908. My mother was born in 1918 um, in uh, Chicago, so they were born both of them in Chicago. Um, they uh, grew up there. They moved to Wilmette the year that I was born, which is 1953. So I was born and raised um, in, in, uh, in that area. Um, and that's, and we, uh, so I, I was a second generation Greek, but grew up with a very strong sense of ethnic identity. Um, we didn't, there was no Greek school up here. There were no churches up here. We didn't speak Greek growing up. Um, but I learned Greek as an adult. That's why it's, that's why I'm so slow um, from tapes that my, that my, that my mother made. So why Chicago? Were there other relatives there or? No, it was just economic at the time. People, a lot of Greeks came um, on the railroad. They came to Chicago because at least then, not now, Chicago was the city that worked. So people came here because you could do well in business. No politics, all right? Yeah, all right. So, tell, tell us a little bit about what did your dad do when he came when, as a young man? Um, and, and did he open his own business? I, I, I never knew that. And so my father was a member of the first graduating class of IIT, um, Illinois Institute of Technology, which is a merger of the Lewis Institute and Armour or something Academy. <clears throat> and he studied accounting. And um, um, so he, he was an accountant. He, um, he practiced accounting like a lot of Greeks. He didn't, he didn't and he was very good at it, um, but he didn't want to be somebody else's accountant. So he went to real estate. The family wound up chartering a savings and loan in 1960, <clears throat> which the charter was changed to a bank. Uh, I have um, siblings much older than me, 13, 14 years older than I. Uh, my brother and sister basically ran that for, gosh, 40, 50 years. Um, and then um, they're, you know, 80, that range, and then eventually uh, retired. So, um, so the whole family was real estate and banking. Um, <clears throat> and uh, when I, and so I was interested in science from a young age. And um, so I, you know, decided to go into medicine. And, you know, education is such a big Greek value. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, it, we, we measure success, you know, as Greek Americans with education. How was that? That must have been a big value stressed in your own home growing up. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, hard work was stressed. Um, the, um, interestingly, our, our family's values were more on being well-rounded. 
So I was, I was a bookworm as a kid. I would just curl up all day in the weekend and read books all day. In fact, my mother was worried about me. And, uh, <laughs> and there were athletes in the family. Her brother was in the White Sox system. Uh, her other brother got a uh, baseball scholarship to the U Chicago back when it was in the Big Ten. So um, my older brother is very athletic. So she, she figured he was a good student. She was just worried that I was going to, you know, just, just be a bookworm. So, so she encouraged uh, sports and I liked sports. I wasn't great at it, but I liked it. Um, so they were much more interested in that um, and in, uh, in, in working hard. I, so I went to Nutra High School, a good high school. Uh, and uh, my, my father was a big believer in community colleges and all that. So I got into Princeton. And, and I remember my father was like, you know, what you, like Princeton, I, what's that? You know, like go to community college. And um, I just, I figured, I don't know. I, I knew nothing about it. I heard it was a good place, you know. So I thought, well, try to go to a good place. Um, so... Um, it, it's an interesting thing. They were um, um, more interested on in working hard, being well-rounded, um, and, and didn't really, um, my, my sister graduated from, from Northwestern. She eventually went to law school later. Um, my brother had no interest in school. Um, he was a good athlete. He was a terrific pool player, um, <laughs> great at cards. And then he uh, went, went to the family business, the bank, and he turned out to be, fan, you know, uh, fantastic at real estate. My sister ran the inside, he ran the outside. So they were much more interested in being um, well-rounded. So can we get a White Sox uh, a baseball card where you're Theo on there or not? Is it? Yeah, no. He, is there uh, one out there? What was his name? His name was Sam Sotis. Uh, he was a f fantastic athlete. He's one of the best at basketball, baseball. Um, he was in their system. At AAA, he fractured his ankle actually um, yeah. when he was away and it kind of ended his, his career. But just a a, a great um, natural athlete. Actually, we grew up uh, Cubs, Cubs fans, uh, despite that. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So, and, and so from high school, you were a bookworm. You did well in school. You went to Princeton. And, and what was your major, what was your academic um, track? Yeah, so I became, you know, I was, I was just, I was just kind of a good student, you know, all the way through pretty much. Um, became less of a bookworm. And, I, and I'm grateful for the upbringing I had, you know, because sports were, sports were emphasized a lot. We, we did that. I, I sang. So I was, uh, um, I, I got this, uh, um, when I went to Princeton, I won this voice scholarship to study there for this lady from New York City Opera. So I went there, <clears throat> was interested in, in um, medicine, was actually encouraged to go into medicine because the thought was, that my brother was in real estate. And if I went in medicine, uh, the, the two of us wouldn't butt heads, you know? So <laughs> I, I just tell you this because the seed was planted and I was welcome. I was happy for the guidance, you know? And yeah. um, so, I, uh, um, so I went to college, uh, studied hard to try to get in, was lucky enough to get into Johns Hopkins, went there to med school, uh, did an internship at the U of Chicago, a residency at Rush, uh, <clears throat> won some research awards there, um, went to um, Harvard and the Massachusetts General Hospital for a sports medicine fellowship, came back to Chicago. Um, I was in academic medicine for 27 years at um, Rush, um, <clears throat> became interested in regenerative medicine, which we'll talk about. Um, so I published some papers. I was asked to edit the first textbook on the anterior cruciate ligament because of some pioneering work I did with on the ACL. Um, and so for most of my career, I was a sports medicine guy. I was the first medical director of the Arena Football League and did that kind of thing. I became interested in regenerative medicine, platelet-rich plasma injection after reading yeah. about Kobe Bryant getting this done in, um, in uh, Germany, 1908 thereabouts, and um, started doing that and said, you know, I I'm a surgeon, but I, I never really took any joy in cutting people up, right? I mean, to me, right. surgery is kind of a failure. You'd like to get people better without it. And you have to operate, you operate. And through regenerative medicine, PRP, it was just amazing because it worked so well. <clears throat> that was 2010. We'll talk more about this, I guess. Um, yeah. But I, I just became progressively more interested and I still do surgery. But most of my work now is, is trying to heal people without surgery, stem cell treatment, P PRP, that kind of thing. Let me back up a little bit, Chad, because a lot of young people um, and, and for our viewers out there, one of our, our signature program is our Heritage Greece program, where we send students to Greece. And continue, when they come back, we continue to mentor them, both of Chad's daughter and my daughter. That's one of the, the benefits of become best friends, met on that trip. But for students in school, and I, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but what made you 
Well, because you're in med school, and obviously when you're in med school, you're not you're not really focused on, hey, I want to do, I want to be an orthopedist. Hey, I want to be a psychiatrist. When did you sort of make the decision, and what what advice do you have for people in, in that in that frame of mind when they're just in med school? How how do you choose what you want to? Well, do? things have changed a lot. And yeah. um, so I debated between heart surgery and orthopedic surgery. And I just thought, well, I don't know, surgery seemed like why not do everything. The, the, the main reason I chose orthopedics, to tell you the truth, is um, I, I wanted to be both a physician and a surgeon. You know, I just didn't want to be somebody who sat in an operating room all day. And orthopedic surgery seemed to offer the potential to do both. So, so when I was, a, I started at Hopkins in 75. To give you an idea, um, my tuition my freshman year was twenty seven hundred dollars oh my and gosh when i graduated it was five thousand if you do the math now i mean there's been inflation but i think it's like fifteen sixteen thousand dollars you know so at that point in time uh my, my my room and board i lived in a dorm was 90 bucks a month um <clears throat> so so people did what they were interested in doing and that was pretty much it and at that point, you know, you could make a good living doing whatever you wanted to do. You could go into whatever field you wanted to go into. Um, and, and so, you know, so I, 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 medicine is fascinating. Med school was fascinating. I, I love what I do. Medicine has changed a lot. And I will tell you um, that now people's decisions in medicine are driven more by practical factors. So when I was in school, nobody had debt. I mean, Princeton was even less than Hopkins, you know? Um, so nobody had debt. Um, and people worked for themselves. One of the things I liked about it, it was uh, autonomy. Um, now, um, they've made med school so expensive. And by the way, for no reason, no reason. It costs nothing to educate a doctor. You know what they do? We, you sit there for two years and you take notes. Now kids don't even go to class. You just sit there, you take notes for eight hours a day, you regurgitate it on tests. You can do that online, cost nothing. Clerkships cost nothing. And, and the, our system absolutely extorts our students. Colleges are basically no better. And what it does is it forces, you know, you've got to be pretty well to do to not have debt. Then when you get out with debt, that means you've got to go work for a corporation. Uh, corporate medicine is illegal in every state in the US, uh, but they make exceptions for hospitals, for foundations. And when you're working for them, you're not, your patient's interests aren't first. They're just not, the corporations are. And they, and they fire people for this. I am bitterly opposed. Every doctor I know is bitterly opposed to this, but the economic forces are such. So what I, what I hear now from people going into medicine, and we have, a lot of pre-meds are interns with our foundation and I, you know, teach and whatnot. <clears throat> the kids just want to get into something where they can get their debt paid off, where they don't make as much money as they used to, where their lifestyle will be the same. So people go into ER medicine, they go into being hospitalists, um, <clears throat> not because it necessarily interests them, but just because they won't have to take night call. Uh, the primary care doctors, which should be fascinating, the ones that I know um, are I don't want to overstate this, but let's just say there are a lot of really unhappy doctors out there because yes. of corporate medicine. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they force people to use electronic medical record system. And so it is the case now that a majority, a majority of a physician's time with patients is not with the patient. It's doing medical records and things like that. So, um, uh, so you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I, I hate to talk like this, but if I were in college now, uh, I wouldn't go into medicine. Um, I think engineering, biomedical engineering, other fields, you can do a lot more and, and not be a slave to uh, corporate interests. I, I think, Chad, the one good thing that maybe came out of this whole COVID crisis, basically, was a receptivity, you know, by school systems, obviously by higher educational systems, of distance learning or online learning, obviously, but you know, you, people had no sort of choice. And, and I think you're right. It's sort of, it's shocking that, you know, whether you have history 101 from Harvard or history 101 from, from a community college, you know, which, which here in Northern Virginia is a couple hundred dollars a semester. It's history 101. Sure. <laughs> history is history. So it doesn't matter really. And hopefully that'll change uh, um, so much. Tell me a little bit about your lovely wife, Marilyn. I, um, I, she, she's a she's a a, a dental surgeon or, or, or oral surgeon. She's a, dental, she's a dentist. She um, EDS. Um, 
So how did um, you guys meet? Yeah. Well, um, so, so Marilyn was actually born in Athena, Elefsina. Um, uh, her father was a, a very prominent um, engineer. Um, and they, they actually, in the late 60s, came over kind of for political reasons, really. Yeah. Uh, her mother was a very educated woman, f- taught French and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> and they, uh, they came to Chicago. Uh, they, they, my um, late mother-in-law had a sister here. Um, and, and, and there again, um, so Marilyn has a sister, Sophia, and he encouraged both of them to do something where they could be independent. And so they both went into dentistry uh, oh. where, where you could. And um, so Marilyn finished at Loyola Dental School um, and she was doing a residency at Rush. Um, I was an attending at Rush at the time. And um, the, truth, the truth of the matter is I was between cases in the operating room and I saw this beautiful young lady <laughs> and as a friend, I said, oh my goodness, who was that? And, um, and they told me that she was, um, a dentist. So I thought, wow, you know, she's, she's beautiful. She's uh, educated. Um, and, um, and she's so Greek. I, I, and she's, <laughs> well, I didn't know she was Greek. I had no idea she was Greek. Her maiden name was Hats, H-A-T-Z. She has green eyes, kind of auburn hair. I, I thought she was probably Polish, you know, it's Hats, <laughs> by the way. And I, um, kind of a funny story. So I introduced myself to her, got her phone number. We hit it off. I asked her out. She turned me down. I uh, called her a week later. She turned me down again. So I said, well, oh, well, and um, didn't think anything of it. And it it turned out that she had asked a friend of hers who I was. And this friend of hers told her that I was married. And I wasn't. I was a 38-year-old bachelor, typical Greek guy, right? You know? And and, um, so a year later, the chief of her department's daughter tore ACL, asked me to do it. So I was in the operating room and he told her, Marilyn, that, that I was doing it. And she said, oh, him, you know, this married scum who's asking me out. And by the way, that was really common in operating rooms in those days. And uh, um, so to make a long story short, he uh, said, Marilyn, I don't, as she tells the story, I don't think he's married. And she found out. And so he told her and then she called me and then, um, uh, and we went out. I still had no idea she was Greek. I picked her up. She was in Arlington Heights, she was living at home, you know? And uh, um, when I dropped her off, I went to talk to her mother and her mother had, I thought, wow, it sounds like kind of a Greek accent. You know? <laughs> and my name, Chad, she didn't know I was Greek either. Isn't that funny? And um, so I said, you're Greek. And yeah, we were. So that was just kind of karma, I guess. And six months later, we were um, engaged. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So let's, let's, let's dive into um, um, stem cells. Um, you know, this regenerative medicine and the stem cells, MPRP. Um, how did you get interested in, into it? And tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about it. And again, you know, I, again, I don't want to get political, but there's there's so much confusion on science with this COVID, what works and what not. So, and there's this whole misnomer about stem yeah. cells too, yeah. that, you know, from aborted fetuses or what have you. But yeah, right, exactly. And tell us about how you got into it and then clear up a little bit about the mystery of stem cells. Right. So I um, mentioned, I saw, read about Kobe Bryant. There was platelet-rich plasma. Platelet-rich plasma, you draw blood, centrifuge it down. Isolate. So what is, yeah, what is, it, what is that PRP too? <laughs> so yeah. so, you, so we, we do this in the office. We've done over 4,000 of them um, as part of a prospective study, the biggest such database by an orthopedist that exists to my knowledge. Um, anyway, so we draw a patient's blood, 40 cc's, not much, it's centrifuged down, you take off the plasma and the buffy coat, which is the white cells and the platelets, discard the red cells, spin it down again, get rid of the excess plasma, um, resuspend the pellet of these platelets and white cells in um, plasma, and then put it in a syringe and inject, and inject it into knees, shoulders, um, elsewhere. Um, so I had read about it, I didn't know if it was legit or not. Um, the first hundred that we did, I processed it all myself. I think I charged people 50 bucks because I, 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 did, I really didn't know. But it was obvious from the first few people that I injected that I was getting amazing results. You know, orthopedic surgeons see musculoskeletal problems where the experts in that were the only people specifically trained to do it. But 95% more of those problems do not need surgery. And we tend to focus more on the surgical applications, but I had people with knee pain, rotator cuff pain. And so, you know, you don't want to do surgery. That's what I was going to say is what kind of like, what kind of uh, uh, ailments do you, does PRP not cure, but benefit? 
Right, that arthritis is the wrong word. Problems. We just published a paper, 80 patients with partial tears of the rotator cuff. Now I'm a rotator cuff surgeon. I fix rotator cuffs for a living if they're completely torn. If they're partially torn though, surgery doesn't much help. A lot of these people wind up getting surgery anyway, because if you're an orthopedic surgeon, that's your tool to help people and you kind of do it. And I did a little of this 30 plus years ago and it just did no good. And I, and I, I just didn't want to do that anymore. Um, right. So we published a paper. We had 75 people, we, and we've done twice that many now, who had partial tears of the rotator cuff, failed physical therapy. Most of them have been told they needed surgery. I don't like using cortisone. Cortisone kills tendon cells. It kills cartilage cells. It should never be injected into tendons. It should never be injected into joints. I know people do it, and I don't mean to trash the people that do, but it just shouldn't happen. And um, so um, we... Of these patients, they had varying degrees of damage. None of them had full thickness tears where it's retracted, where you have to reattach it. And none of them, none of them wound up needing surgery. And in none of them did the tear clinically uh, progress. So we just published this paper. It's just accepted for publication. The prospective study that goes back seven years, just accepted about two months ago. Um, so this was very exciting to me. You could take the, the most common cause of shoulder pain. Surgery doesn't do any good. Cortisone makes them worse. Uh, drugs, we don't like drugs, uh, anti-inflammatory pills, uh, mask pain, interfere with healing, cause stomach ulcers, kidney problems and whatnot. So we had a tool to treat it. And it's, it's very exciting to me. So we do that. <clears throat> we'll use it for Achilles problems when and they're bad. If I, if I may, you said yeah. something very wise to me once, that pain is sometimes a way of the body telling you to change your Absolutely. behavior. And don't take, don't take drugs. It just, you know, uh, uh, quiet the pain because what, 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 what's hurting you, the ailment can get worse, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so we tell patients pain is your friend. Um, so we talk to patients, we tell them to keep their elbows down, not do things that make it hurt. Um, the, the problem with the paradigm of talking to people about activity modification and whatnot, and I don't inject most people with PRP. It's probably 5% of the people with partial rotator cuff tears. Most people just get better if you just instruct them how to use their bodies. The problem with that paradigm, and, and, and forgive the cynicism, um, it's, it just kind of has overtaken me in recent years, is that nobody makes any money doing that, right? I mean, our system is designed, pharma, pharma's great, but it's designed to sell drugs. I mean, look on TV, right? You can be, you can be CNN or you can be Fox News um, and it's, it's pharma, right? So, so pharma has so much money that they market, they sell drugs. A lot of drugs are great, but we take way too many of them. Um, and, you know, telling people to avoid things that hurt, you know, you're not selling drugs, you're not selling physical therapy, you're not selling cortisone shots, you're not selling surgery. Um, and you have to take time to talk to your patients. The, the average orthopedic patient in this country, they used to say was about six minutes. Um, it's less than that now because half the time you don't even see the doctor, right? I'm, I mean, I'm kind of quaint. I actually see each of my own patients. Um, so, you know, taking time to talk to your patient isn't, isn't a good business model. But as you said, pain is your friend. And I'll just tell something to everybody out there, two things to keep in mind. If it hurts, don't do it. Um, and, and just stay away from pills. There was, there was no drug, no pill. There are some supplements that help that are, you know, that are, that are uh, good for musculoskeletal problems. And back, back surgery usually is avoidable, correct? For back, a lot of patients. Yeah. And I'll tell you, we are just preparing a paper now for publication uh, through our foundation. Something like 500 patients, just to get back to PRP, for arthritis, not even stem cells. And most of the people, most of the people were able to avoid joint replacements. Most of the people that we see with back pain are able to, most people that I see that have had surgery recommended, most of them, majority of them really don't need it. Yeah. Nothing against the doctors who are recommending it because that's what they know. I was lucky enough to get into regenerative medicine and stem cell treatment and have seen its benefits. But if you're not in that world, um, it's tough. And you know, you mentioned, um, you, you mentioned COVID and all that. Um, um, you know, PRP is cash. It's not paid for by insurance. Um, to get stem cells or PRP paid for, you, you know, the FDA wants double blind, randomized, placebo controlled studies. These studies are incredibly expensive. If you're bringing a new drug out, pharma has lots of money to pay for those studies. Right. God bless them. It's terrific. Yeah. But, you know, physicians in practice don't. So if you don't have an industrial or pharmaceutical intermediary who stands to profit by it, these studies don't get done. If the studies aren't done, um, insurance doesn't pay for it. Yeah. They're legal, they're just not paid for. 
So we'll tra- and, and I want to just uh, segue into the stem cell discussion that we were going to start. And I just want to, I remember being at your office with a friend that you treated. And, and I remember you took me into the office and, the, and you were treating a gentleman who was, you know, morbidly, I mean, 500 plus pounds, bone on bone, I believe. And you gave him the stem cells. And he, the stem cell treatment was popping up and down and just said, I feel great. I feel like a kid, you know, but, it, but maybe you could, you know, you, you transitioned from PRP to stem cells. How did you get into it? What is a stem cell? Sure. And, so and clear up the science a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the gentleman you mentioned, by the way, so that, that wasn't the day we did it, but a week later and I just saw him. So he went from 440 pounds to 220 pounds. God bless him. And, um, and he said that, you know, the, the fact that his knee pain was better allowed him to lose weight. This is actually four years later now. He's still doing well. I saw wow. him shoulder, I think something else. Um, so we do PRP a lot for musculoskeletal problems. It's less expensive. It's immediate. Um, so, so I, as, as I was doing PRP starting in 2010, about 2014, 2015, same way I started reading about stem cell treatment, became intrigued, started doing what the FDA will let us do in the United States, which is taking bone marrow aspirate. You stick a needle in your pelvis and take bone out. Take a sm- you can take a small amount of fat out to use as cushioning. And we did this for arthritis and we actually published a paper and in moderate arthritis, it wasn't too bad. But at the same time this was going on- so Again, was- stem cells, just to interrupt you. Just to be clear, so you're, you're, you're removing stem cells from the abdomen? Well, let me, let me yeah. go on for a minute. Yeah, you, you take fat, fat has stem cells, but the FDA will not let us isolate the stem cells. I see. You take bone marrow, which has some stem cells, but very few. And the way to get a good number is to culture them. So the FDA did not use to regulate human tissue. They started in 2005. And in the 90s, people started doing great stem cell research. And a lot of it just stopped. And then the EMA in Europe, the same way because they regulated it, kind of regulated it out of existence because it became illegal to do high quality stem cell work where you concentrate stem cells. So the only thing they left us with was bone marrow aspiration. Bone marrow aspiration doesn't work very well by itself in joints. In some cases it does and we combine it with fat, but they won't let us digest fat. I won't get into all the regulatory morass of this, but they've said, well, it may not be safe and it may not be effective. And it's the same thing. You have to do double blind, randomized, placebo controlled studies. These studies, some of them are working their way through, but the money just doesn't exist to do them. And it's really a shame. However, in Asia, Korea, China, they've kept on doing these. And so we're reading research and it was amazing stuff. So um, I um, became more and more interested. I did a little of what they would let us do and it was minimally effective, you know? Um, And, um, became interested in doing what I had been reading about, which was very effective. Um, and there's three or four different ways you, you can um, do it. And I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. And I'll tell you yeah. what stem cells are a little bit. What, what, what is a stem cell, Chad? So a stem cell um, is a cell basically that can grow into another kind of cell. Now, I will tell you, the promise of stem cells initially was that we, you know, we'd inject it into a joint and you'd grow new cartilage or you'd inject it into something else and grow new tissue. And That happens here and there. But the other property that stem cells have is they are immunomodulatory. So, so, you know, MS and Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and autism and pulmonary fibrosis and COPD, um, these problems um, are inflammatory problems where your body attacks itself. Actually, it turns out osteoarthritis is kind of like that too. So if you can get the immune system to not attack you so much or less, you get much better. Stem cells have no side effects, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And that's the great promise of them. In some ways, they, they're, they're kind of like prednisone or Humira or Embril or these immunosuppressive drugs that you see advertised all the time with all these, all these smiling patients and all these commercials who are skipping around with psoriatic arthritis or something else, right? Taking these drugs, which help their symptoms, but which can have horrible side effects, right? So stem cells do the same thing, modulate your immune system and basically have no side effects. And, and I'll tell you about that in a second too. We, we published several papers on this actually where we survey the literature. So you can get stem cells. Originally people would get it from a bone marrow aspirate. You take some bone marrow out and then you send it to a lab to be isolated and cultured. You could do the same thing by taking a small amount of fat out. Um, there's other things where you can take fat out, digest it with an enzyme and put it back. More, the, the, probably the best stem cell source now, which can have more. So these are not, 
fetal. These are not embryonic. These are ladies donate umbilical cords after birth, which used to be thrown away. There's something called Wharton's jelly. The Wharton's jelly has the same kind of cell. They're called mesenchymal stem cells, but they're younger. They're metabolically active. They can be sort. They can be mass cultured. They're cheaper, and that's mostly what we're doing now. But these are mesenchymal stem cells. Now, let me talk to you about risk. Um, we published a systematic review. We looked at every paper ever published in what's called the PubMed Index Literature on Arthritis, like 60 papers, stem cells from each of the sources that I mentioned. So we looked at serious adverse events. There were none, zero, not a one. So can these cells grow and, and become cancerous and become tumors? No, has never happened. Um, will they cause infections? I mean, you, you can get an infection at any time by sticking a needle into somebody, but none has been reported. There were no serious adverse events. And this should not be surprising because stem cells are what nature has evolved. Stem cells is how you heal yourself. All we're doing is concentrating them, putting them where they're needed, and helping nature. This is very different from drugs, right, which are chemicals, and you don't know what they're going to do. Take a drug like Pepsid, right? It's been used for an, as an antacid for decades, and it comes out more recently that it can, it's carcinogenic, right? So you don't know with chemicals, but stem cells don't cause these problems. Now, what has happened is we are working on a much more ambitious paper. We've been working on it for about a year, and we're almost done with it. Well, we set out to find every serious adverse event anywhere in the world with any kind of uh, stem cell for any problem. And I'll tell you, there are very, very few. No tumors of any kind, except one questionable benign tumor in Thailand in a kidney. We, we can't even find out what happened. Uh, there there um, uh, infections. There are probably an infection or two here or there, but, but none reported. Um, teratomas, no. So what happens though is, that in the media, there are three or four things that have been done. The things that we identified as being bad are from egregious use. There was a practitioner, not a physician in Florida, who injected stem cells and PRP into people's eyes and blinded several people. Uh, that should never have been done. Uh, there was, um, I mean, there isn't much else. There was a cord blood, which are not stem cells, which two years ago caused infections in some people, but this is because they were cultured in a, in a dirty lab. There was something that was in the media people talked to me about uh, a year ago, where they said that people in Portugal got tumors in their, in their neck, in their cervical spine. Well, it turns out that what was done is that people took a biopsy from people's nose and took all of that tissue. They didn't separate out the stem cells, they injected the cervical spine. So six or seven years later, people started to get cysts in their cervical spine, it wasn't cancer, cysts, and they were mucus cysts from the mucus cells not the stem cells. Um, there are two cases in China of two people that got blood clots in their arms, nothing bad happened. I mean, these are tens of thousands of cases. Stem cells are basically the safest treatment that exists. But I will just tell you, um, you know, stem cells outcompete pharmaceutical drugs, right? You can treat MS with good results with no side effects. Um, and the FDA is a creature of pharma. And look, I'm not here to criticize the FDA. I think they're wonderful people who are trying to do their best. But I'm just telling you, when you were, used to work for drug companies and you're working for them now and you're going to work for them when you get done, people tend to see um, treatments through that prism, let's just say. So the net effect has been that these stem cells, even though they're incredibly safe, we're not using embryonic tissue. They, you don't need any kind of, uh, uh, they don't cause any kind of immunologic reaction, even when they're coming from this Wharton's jelly that I talked about. They're incredibly safe. They're infected. We have 17 clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov. We just uh, put these up recently um, for, um, for, uh, for MS, for pulmonary fibrosis, for Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Uh, uh, diabetes, um, erectile dysfunction, uh, renal failure, and on and on. Autism. Um, and, you know, why autism? That's strange, isn't it? I thought it was strange yeah. when I read the, the studies. But autism, it turns out, is an immunologic disease. Some people refer to it as a brain allergy. This is documented. And anytime you have an autoimmune problem, stem cells can help. So is it a cure? No. ALS. The only treatment that has done any good for ALS clinically is stem cells. They don't cure it but they have been shown to significantly slow it down in many people. So um, we don't hype it. We don't cure it. We, there's a lot of unscrupulous people out there who will tell you that it cures this and that. When we treat patients, we show them the research articles that we have. And we say, you know, 
for, like for MS, it's reliably effective, some things much less. And we say, this is what we know, this is what it costs, these are the risks, uh, decide what you want to do. Um, and I will tell you, the corollary is, I can't do these kinds of things in the US. We do some things, we are flying a patient to Chicago in two days with ALS to um, treat free of charge with a, um, ALS with stem cells. Um, we're all donating our time. I got the stem cell company to donate theirs. We had to get compassionate use permission for the FDA. I will tell you, it's taken us a month. It's taken hours and hours and hours to get them to approve this. I think we just got the approval this afternoon. Patients flying out tomorrow. So where we can, we do that. But what has been forced to happen is that because you really can't do this stuff in the U.S., um, people offshore have taken advantage of medical tourism. So we were set up in Nassau for a little while. There's a big clinic in Panama, another one, a couple in Mexico, Caymans. We are in Antigua now. We have a wonderful clinic there. And unfortunately, we have to bring people there to do real stem cell treatment, cultured stem cells. We'll inject, you know, through, through what we can, I can get a bone marrow aspirate and inject about, oh, 50, 60, 70,000 stem cells in a joint. The treatments that we're doing now, we inject 100 million stem cells. And the, and the treatment we can do, you can't inject systemically. So it's orders of magnitude better. The Chinese continue to pump out literature, as do the Koreans. The Western Europeans are like us. It's heavily restricted. Actually, I will tell you that Greece is more favorable. And we've set up in Athens that are going to start treating there. And I think this would be good for the, um, for the Greek economy. So, so we are forced to, to fly people to Antigua to bring them there to inject them. Um, we can't do this for free. Uh, we charge for it. Uh, the going rate for these stem cell treatments is anywhere from $25,000 in most offshore places, $45,000 in, um, in China. Uh, there are some people that are charging, there was a big article in the Tribune about somebody who was cured of MS, $150,000 for that, you know? Uh, um, and even more than that, we charge $15,000 in general, sometimes less than that. Uh, basically because there's overhead to getting down there. Uh, we have to turn enough of a profit to keep our doors open, but we're, it's just really unfortunate. Um, and, and I think these treatments over time will slowly get to be legalized in the US, but there are people who are suffering now that can be helped now. Um, and that's, so, so, so that's, that's our goal. Yeah. We, no, sorry, I have to be going on for so long. No, that's okay. Yeah. No, but I wanted to ask you also about because yeah. I know I know that the Israelis are doing quite a bit of research, great research. Well, themselves and uh, with MS, I think you mentioned, and some other. Well, they, they Parkinson's, they Parkinson's I believe too. Yeah, there was a Greek who went. Dimitrios Karousis, very bright guy. Uh, did he was Greece wouldn't let him do his work twenty five years ago because they thought, well, you know, stem cells, you're aborting babies, right? He wasn't, but. So he went to the University of Hadassah, he did some things there, but Israel has started to clamp down too. Western Europe has clamped down. And, um, and so it's, uh, it, it, it's gotten to be harder for him. <clears throat> so, so our goal is to do high level studies, um, which tends to not be done um, offshore. So we, we do high level research studies. We publish great things in great journals. I was in academic medicine. I mean, this is what we do. Um, I have great researchers working for me. Um, so we prospectively evaluate everybody. We follow up our results. We publish in good journals. So the idea is to do American scientific rigor um, with the treatments that you can't get in America and not, not to hype it in some back room in some place that maybe you don't want to go to. Yeah. Chad, are there... Um... Where do fellow physicians learn? Are there conferences or, or med medical conferences in Europe or elsewhere where, where this is, where you can learn more about this as far if you're a physician or, or, or in the sciences? Or? You know, um, it's unfortunate, but the, the physician learning and the media and the courses uh, so, so we teach it and, and, you know, and, and we publish papers but it's not, um, um, it's really not promoted. Um, and in fact, um, in many cases, American doctors, I won't say this is always the case, but are a little threatened by it uh, because- um, uh, It's disruptive, it's disruptive. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe if there's something that you're not doing, maybe you're losing a patient, you know? And, uh, and, um, and many doctors say, well, you know, if it's, I don't know anything about it, it's not FDA approved. And the, 
learning sources that exist. Uh, I don't, don't really favor it. So we, we try to get the word out by publishing papers. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's tough because doctors, I, you know, there, there was a resident who was calling me for advice, finishing her last year of, uh, oh, I think it's family medicine and said, you know, I feel like I'm just being trained to pump people full of drugs. Um, you know, so that that's where our system is. The hospitals that employ doctors now um, don't really allow doctors to uh, do things that, that they don't, you know, in, in COVID, right? We published a paper on hydroxychloroquine uh, showing that it's effective, that it's safe. Um, ivermectin is safe, but many hospitals won't let doctors prescribe it, right? It's outside of the pharmaceutical mainstream. And I'm not saying they're not well-intended. I think they are well-intended, but the answer to your question is it's not well understood by publishing good papers in good medical journals. We promulgate these. This is how we try to teach doctors. Okay. We have a, a you know, let me just squeeze in a couple of questions here from uh, uh, some of the audience members. Um, let me just do them all together. Will stem cells help with degenerative discs? How can you help with arthritic bone spurs in the spine? And then lastly, how about PRP and ovaries for women with diminished ovarian reserve? So I'll tell you about each of those. Uh, okay. Regarding discs, uh, there is evidence that it can help. Um, injecting a disc is a tricky thing. We have engaged one of the world's best pain specialists in Chicago. His name is Ken Candido. And starting in November, he's going to be coming down um, to Antigua and we're going to be injecting stem cells um, into discs and into other areas of the spine. And can it help? Yes, it can, it can help. Uh, the bone spurs do not cause pain, by the way. Bone spurs are just a sign that you have arthritis. And PRP and stem cells have been shown to help arthritis wherever they have been used. From our perspective, uh, if you've got really severe arthritis, we'll use stem cells. We had a lady who we just did two months ago, deformed shoulders, bone on bone, horrible. PRP is not going to help that. And we know because we did a study. We found out it's good for early arthritis, but not for that. We took her down there, injected both her shoulders. Um, and her motion isn't much better because her shoulders are so deformed, but her pain is much better. Um, in the spine, uh, PRP has been used a little. It isn't good for discs because disc, um, you can only get about a cc of fluid into a disc. PRP works similar to, to stem cells. It has growth factors, but you can't get enough growth factors in with PRP to do much good. But we can get 10 million stem cells in one cc of fluid to put it into a disc. So that's what we're doing there. Uh, regarding ovarian function, there. so can PRP help? Not that I know of. Um, and th there are some reports about stem cells, but nothing that has been convincing to us. Yeah. It's Chad, you know, I almost called you, as you know, when, uh, when the great Yanis and that the Kumbo got hurt because uh, we have, we have a, an affiliation with the Bucks through one of, one of our late members, a great mutual friend of ours, Dr. George Corcus, owned him at one time. But I know you treat a lot of professional sports athletes. So, so what are these two treatments? Because that's where I think, you, you know, if you have a Kobe or, 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 or a Yanis or someone else that can that can be a champion of this. They, they may be able to quash some of the challenges with the FDA, but, but what, what type of, uh, uh, what type of ailments uh, would, would this, would, would stem cell help for, for typical sports injuries? Let's say, cause you, you mentioned rotator cuff. Yeah. So, so we use for sports injuries, we use PRP wherever we can. So we use it for Achilles. So by the way, most things get better if you just leave them, if you get people off of drugs, um, so Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Meloxicam, Diclofenac, Celebrex, interfere with healing, have complications. In our world, there are some indications. If you have an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, they can be useful. But we get all our patients off of all of these drugs. So if you get people off of things that mitigate pain, don't ice, don't take drugs, don't wrap, don't use icy hot, feel the pain, avoid what hurts. Most people get better just from that, honestly. Um, physical therapy for arthritis, most of the time when we see it, it makes people worse. Why? Because people are told if you strengthen the muscles around a joint, an arthritic joint, it makes it better. It doesn't. When you, when you strengthen muscles that span a joint, they compress the arthritic ends of the bones together, that makes them hurt. 
everybody should exercise because it's good for your overall health. But we get people off of everything that hurts. We get them off of all drugs. Most people get better. The ones that don't, we use PRP. The ones that still don't, um, maybe candidates for stem cells. I have professional athletes that I treat actually who, who don't want their teams to know that I'm treating them because they don't want them to know that, you know, that, they, that, 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 that they have a problem. So for most musculoskeletal problems, we use PRP. For severe arthritis, we use stem cells. Uh, for severe backs, we're gonna start using um, stem cells. Um, for, uh, you know, for other disorders, a traumatic brain injury in some of these athletes and in others, uh, autoimmune disorders, um, PRP does no good, really can't be used. And, and that's where stem cells, stem cells has had amazing results in autism, you know, for example, right? Amazing results in MS. Uh, and that's where we use them more. Um, for arthritis, we use it more for resistive cases. So Chad, let's just say you're, you know, you're injecting these 10 million uh, uh, stem cells into, into my body, into let's just say my knee for an ailment without getting into the, the chemistry of, of what's happening or, or the biology of what's happening, can you describe what is happening basically? Yeah. How, how is it growing? I mean, yeah, what, well, let me is say it, what is happened. So, and, and I'm glad you asked. So I just had a patient the other day who I get a lot of second opinions. They, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? This patient paid $9,000 for a completely bogus treatment in Florida. Just, just lied to. And um, the doctor there said, that showed an x-ray saying they grew new cartilage. Well, nobody has grown new cartilage with stem cells. And if you want to sell it, which is not our purpose, we, I mean, we try to talk people out of this, if there's any question. If you want to sell it, you tell people that it grows new tissue. Now, there's, there's a doctor, a Dr. Atala, he's the head of the Wake Forest Regenerative Medicine Institute, probably the best one in the country or the world. He has grown new bladders from stem cells that he's put into people. He's a urologist. Amazing stuff. But that is very much the exception right now. So what they do, though, are two things. There are growth factors with long names, transforming growth factor beta platelet to drive growth factor, vascular and ethelial growth factor, several of them. They take tissue that's damaged and make it healthier, the growth factors, but they're not regenerating tissue. They're not growing new tissue. Someday, maybe not now. The second thing is there are cytokines, uh, which belong, many of them, to the interleukin family. So cytokines can cause, interleukin-1 causes inflammation, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist fights it. The Kobe Bryant treatment used that kind of a lot. So these treatments quell inflammation with these interleukins. Cortisone quells inflammation, but it kills cartilage cells, um, kills tendon cells. These treatments quiet inflammation and they're healthy. And then there are growth factors which help you heal. PRP and stem cells work similarly in this regard Stem cells just have a lot more of them. They work better. Uh, it's not, it may be that in some cases, the stem cells take root and grow and keep doing this. We're not as sure about that. It's harder to say, but that's how they work. I see. Uh, is this a good time to maybe show that film? Sure. So yes. this is about our um, foundation. It's, it's kind of self-explanatory. So it's, it's four minutes. I'm going to ask Maria to tee it up and show it and hope the audience enjoys it. Many currently incurable diseases leave patients suffering with pain and disability and even increased mortality without good treatment options. The list includes MS, Parkinson's disease, cerebral palsy, spinal cord injury paralysis, Crohn's disease, memory loss, leg ulcers, aging frailty, and many others. Immunosuppressive drug treatment does not stop the progression of the disease nor the deterioration of the patient and in some cases is completely ineffective. And they are associated with dangerous side effects such as severe infection, increased risk of cancer and organ failure. But there is available today a safe treatment that significantly improves all of these conditions and many more, such as diabetes, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, ED, and pulmonary fibrosis in a majority of patients, generally without any serious side effects. This treatment is called a mesenchymal stem cell or MSC injection. And MSCs are adult, not embryonic cells, so there is no ethical concern. Unfortunately, due to well-intended but overly restrictive FDA regulations designed for pharmaceutical drugs, 
MSCs are not freely allowed in the USA or Europe except in small clinical trials available to only very limited numbers of patients at least many years away from open patient access. Our goals are to arrange for suffering patients to receive state-of-the-art stem cell treatment now and to use the data from their treatment to hasten wider approval of MSCs in the USA and worldwide. We are the foundation for orthopedics and regenerative medicine, the forum a 501c3 nonprofit research and education foundation and the Prodromo Stem Cell Institute. We perform world-leading stem cell and regenerative medicine research, conduct rigorous clinical trials, provide education to public and professional audiences, and are working to provide financial assistance to those who need but cannot afford stem cell treatment. Most advanced stem cell treatment in this hemisphere is now conducted outside the United States but sometimes in clinics with lower standards than U.S. medical centers. The forum is necessary to provide the high-level research infrastructure that allows the clinical stem cell treatment performed by the Prodromo Stem Cell Institute to meet or exceed the highest United States standards of rigor and safety. First, we maintain a federally qualified and registered institutional review board to review our research studies. When completed, we publish our results in prestigious medical journals and textbooks and present our findings at leading international medical meetings. Our expert team based in our Glenview, Illinois Center includes a Northwestern trained registered nurse, a Loyola Chicago trained medical doctor, a University of Chicago trained biologist, a Loyola and Rush trained dentist, a Northwestern University master's degree data analyst and medical director Chadwick Prodromos MD. We also maintain a vigorous intern program training future physicians and scientists in research methods. In our lab in Glenview, we also perform basic research analyzing stem cell tissue and photobiomodulation stem cell enhancement research. We are a lean and efficient organization. 100% of your donation funds clinical research that improves stem cell treatment in real time and the health of patients in need. Dollar for dollar, we believe there is no greater return on your philanthropic donation. If you would like to contribute to cutting edge stem cell research and changing lives through groundbreaking treatments, please contact this email or the number below. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. That's great. Chad, you had mentioned Wake Forest. What are, what are other institutions where a young person or, or professional could, could study regenerative medicine that you would recommend? So I would say this, um, I, you know, it depends on the discipline you want to go into. A lot of this is cell biology. Um, not, so much medicine. You can get into medicine, but it's not, you know, it, it's not, there, there aren't fellowships in it. There aren't residencies in it. Um, uh, but if you're a medical doctor that is so inclined, you can do that. But, but cell biology is where a lot of the action is. Um, it's, it's just, um, you know, it's tricky and it's difficult because the, the money in medicine is all in pharmaceutical drugs and drugs are great, don't get me wrong. Um, but you just have to sort of have a passion for it. Um, you can be a medical doctor, you can be a dentist, you can be an engineer, um, um, but, but there isn't one uh, unified path. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's look through the prism of your crystal ball. Where do you see this discipline or this, this, this miracle basically going years from now? Because it's only a matter of time, I guess, before these, you know, as you mentioned, you'll, you'll be do, publishing more, you'll be more accepted, you'll have sports people, celebrities, others, you know, because just, just like what Michael J. Fox was, the, the face of Parkinson's, and, and he spurred so many research dollars into that, and, and, and they've come up with various treatments that have made it better. So where do you see, st where do you see this going in the future? Well, it's absolutely the future of medicine. And when you think about it, these diseases, in, including cancer, by the way, and, and stem cells haven't done much with cancer yet, um, but you know, what is MS? That's your body attacking itself. So your body loses self tolerance, right? So figuring out a way to regain that self tolerance. I was just on the phone today with a brilliant um, 
actually South American is also at Wake Forest cell biologist MD. And we're talking about, you know, he's developed a way to make sort of vaccines for this kind of thing. Um, so all of these diseases are, are going to be cured, even osteoarthritis. You know, we see patients all the time who say, well, I have bone on bone arthritis and it's hopeless, I need a joint replacement. There are millions of people running around with bone on bone joints with no pain at all. The ones that have pain, it's because their body has gotten inflamed and sort of attacking itself. So all of these diseases that I've talked about are, are so this is my crystal ball, um, are going to be cured. And we're, we're on the way now. Um, it's an entirely different path than suppressing the symptoms with drugs. Drugs are great. Drugs have their place, but they're toxic. This is non-toxic. So this is the future. A lot of the future is here right now and people get better right now. That's the thing that, um, uh, uh, you know, and you mentioned uh, Mel Gibson's father was treated with stem cells and had a great result. And he interviewed by Joe Rogan and that brought a lot of attention to it. So more people go offshore. People are hungry for this treatment. The people that we see have looked online and they're trying to figure out, they know they can't get it here. So they say to me, well, here's this clinic in Mexico or Costa Rica or Panama or whatever, you know, what's legit, what isn't. And some of them are and some of them not so much. And we try to tell people. So the future is, Regenerative medicine is going to cure all these things. I don't think it's going to be that long. The unfortunate part is that the well-intended regulatory framework is dramatically slowing it down. And because there aren't intermediaries in general who make a lot of money off it, although that may be changing a little, it, I mean, it's okay. But if there were more dollars behind it from, from intermediaries, it would progress faster. Yeah. And it's interesting because you said that, you know, MS, I didn't know that, that it's the body attacking itself. And before you had mentioned cytokine and we know <laughs> from watching Dr. Fauci and others every day on TV that, you know, these cytokine storms that people are dying from you know, with COVID is the body killing themselves. So, so there's, and, and heavens knows how, how many research dollars are going into COVID research. Do you see a possible, is there a possible link with virus? I mean, I don't know, but is there a link between what, what, what stem cells can do in viruses in general? Oh, there is. And actually, I, I work with a very good company uh, it's called Vitro Biopharma in Colorado. They supply us with the umbilical cells. That is mostly what we do now, although we use adipose and some others as well. Um, <clears throat> Um, they have a clinical trial. So it has been used um, in people on respirators with COVID. And I don't want to overstate this, but this and other stem cell treatments have been, have been effective. Um, no question that they're effective. Um, and so um, they've been trying to put together a clinical trial that was set to go last fall. We were set to go. The FDA came back. They had done mouse research. Um, and actually, I, I don't want to say things that are confidential, so I won't. But let's just say that there were delays. Um, and it looks like it's going to get going now. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely effective for that. But again, um, you know, remdesivir um, is $3,400. There's some evidence that it helps. Not fantastic evidence, but some evidence that it helps. Uh, ivermectin helps. But I was just reading on the internet yesterday, they were talking about it as a livestock drug as though to be pejorative. Ivermectin is used for scabies and people and other things. It's absolutely used in people. It's safe. Um, hydroxychloroquine the same way. We published papers on this. Hydroxychloroquine became unpopular because Trump recommended it and then people who hated Trump hated hydroxychloroquine. The other thing about it is hydroxychloroquine is 17 cents a pill. Ivermectin is cheap. Remdesivir is $3,000 a pill, right? So, um, you know, um, we still live in a capitalist um, system. But the short answer to your question is stem cells absolutely help. They help acutely. And there are studies that are forming for long COVID. You know, will they help in the long run? And I'm sure that they will. And they're completely safe. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, before we sign off, on the lab in Greece and what your prospects are there. And uh, um, what, what is medical tourism? Because <laughs> you had mentioned well, that. Um, I've heard so, about it in plastic surgery, you know, where, where right. you go get a nose job somewhere, no, no one will see you, and you come back in your person. So, Right. Um, so um, the United States FDA is restrictive. I mean, they're trying to protect people. They just, they just overdo it, you know? And, um, um, uh, and by the way, there was a great article with ALS of a lady 
who was an ALS researcher, her, her husband did research, and he waited for two years. It, it'll, I, you cry when you read this. It was, I think, in the Washington Post published, and he died waiting to get into a trial. This is why we're doing what we're doing, to make this stuff available today. And at our center, it is. Um, but anyway, um, so the FDA is restrictive and they're slow. Uh, the EMA in Europe, which is the equivalent, is in lockstep basically with the FDA. But in Europe, it's country by country. So France, Germany, the UK, Italy um, are pretty much like the US. Um, other countries in Greece, not so much. In Europe, sorry, not so much like Greece and some others. Um, so we became aware of this. We were looking for a place um, in that part of the world because we get people calling us from China all over the place. Greece is closer. There are some things that we want to do in a hospital, um, in, a, in a tertiary care medical center, which doesn't exist in Antigua. So, and you know, I'm of Greek descent and, and, and there's a lot of smart people in Greece. So we've spent a couple of years now talking to people in Greece. We recently came to an agreement um, with uh, a doctor at Miteta Hospital, which uh, Miteta, Metropolitan and Igea were bought by a British VC firm. They're great places um, to do some work with adipose tissue there. Um, we are just getting going with that. But Greece has a, a very sophisticated medical infrastructure. They're regulatorily favorable. Um, it's a place that people want to go to. Uh, we think Greece can be the stem cell mecca of that part of the world for sure. And we are, we are trying to make that happen. What is medical tourism? Medical tourism is that you're in Germany or we have a patient from Turkey actually, who is probably going to be coming to Athens. Who we've been talking to has a terrible autoimmune disease. Um, and um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, you, know, you know, is going to be coming. So there is tremendous capacity to help people. There is tremendous capacity for revenue from this to the Greek economy. There's spillover revenue to hospitality and other areas. Um, there is the potential to reverse the brain drain. You know, Greeks are smart people and the, the best and the brightest are leaving uh, because of the problems there. Um, they are, stem cell work captivates everybody and people will come back. So we are working hard um, to try to make that happen. We think there are great possibilities. Um, there's a, a company out of um, Israel called um, um, or, or Genesis, which has uh, struck a deal with a, 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 a tissue bank in Greece called Theracell uh, to work together. We're excited about it. We're working with them as well um, to, make, uh, to make Athena. Uh, we've also talked to people in Cyprus, a mecca for this. We think that's going to happen, uh, will happen, um, and, 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 and people will come and, and, and do well. Well, God speak to you, Chad. Um, we're on the hour. Chad, what, uh, sort of, let's wax a little philosophical. What do you want to best be remembered for, other than, other than curing my daughter's name? <laughs> um, I, you know, Which is what I, I, would, <laughs> I, I want to best be, you know, um, Slim, Carlos Slim, right? He used to be the richest man in the world. He's, I'm sure he's up there. Um, he said... Um, you should not concentrate on making a better world for your children. You should concentrate on making better children for the world. So, you know, there's only a few things in life that are meaningful to me for being philosophical here. I, I'm blessed. Uh, Marilyn and I are blessed to have two just wonderful daughters. Uh, you know, they're, um, they're bright. They're, they're, just, they're just wonderful people. I, I don't know exactly why God was so good to us. So, you know, if I can have two wonderful children for the world, that's the thing I most care about. Um, I, I want to be a, a good husband to Marilyn. Um, I have other, you know, family members. So that's what's meaningful to me. Family is meaningful to me. Um, the stem cell and the medical work, um, you know, it's what I do. So I want to try to do it well. But if I were a plumber or I sold insurance, I tried to do that well, you know, just, just, just try to work hard. But that's, that's what I want to be known for. Well, that's great, Chad. I really enjoyed it. I think the audience um, um, enjoyed it tremendously. There was one question here about using your own stem cells. And I think you can do that, correct? But they're, not as, but they're not as effective as you said. I think. Well, no, they, actually they are. So uh, I'll say, by the way, by the way, we get inquiries from all over. 
And we are happy to talk to people. I've got a great team. So if anybody listening has a question about stem cell treatment, I don't know if my phone number is down there uh, someplace. Um, but it's, you know, it's Prodromos. I'm in Chicago. You can look me up. We have an entity also called the Prodromo Stem Cell Institute. Um, we'll and, add it. We'll add it on the YouTube. So. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Um, so if you have questions about any entities, uh, call us, email us, we'll respond. There's no charge for that. And we're happy, um, to do that. Um, and so tell me, ask me your question again. I'm sorry. I got carried away. No, the, the, the question was about using your own stem cells. Right. So sorry. How is that? Yeah. So there, the stem cells we use are called mesenchymal. They're partially differentiated. They don't have any capacity to become tumor-like. And so we use your own stem cells from adipose tissue, your own fat. Um, bone marrow, we did not so much. Uh, we also use allogeneic ones from Wharton's jelly. Same kind of cell. Um, a little more metabolically active and actually less expensive. So we have the capacity, we can take a biopsy of your own tissue, um, fat, it can be sent to a tissue bank, they isolate the cells, they culture them, they grow them, and then they can be flown back on liquid nitrogen and injected. They can maintain um, like a colony of them. So if you ever have a problem in the future, they can be used again. So we can absolutely use your own stem cells. And you know, we have patients, we tell people, they're a little more expensive to do that, but. You know, some people say, I want my own cells, and that's fine. And there's, uh, you, you could definitely use them, and there's, there are good results with them. Do you know, Chad, you know, uh, the military, DARPA, um, are, are so much, so, so many uh, of the, the things we have today, including the internet, you know, started with DARPA. Is, is the military, in, in the military invests and stuff like that, is the military looking at stem cells or, or investing money? They seem to be sort of immune from the regulatory process. Um, they are. Um, the, the military um, is potentially interested in the um, uh, stem cells for COVID that I mentioned, you know. Um, the military is interested in a traumatic brain injury. We're starting to um, talk to people from the, the government in that regard. Good. Well, that's great. I think it's a bright future. Um, you know, I know, I know in the beginning, it, you were a little bit cynical about, about the, the state's affairs, but but the good news is it can change, right? It can only get better. And I think it will get better with, with people like you. I want to thank you, Chad, for your friendship, for, for your contributions. Um, I think, I think you reflect so many of, of our values of giving back. I've known you for a long time and, and, and you're for real, you know, that you, I know that you really care about your patients and about what you do. And for that, we're very, very grateful and, and hope uh, you continue. So thank you. Yeah, and and you know, um, Art, you're the you're the poster child for bringing people together, and caring about people. I've been in the NHS now for 2011, I guess, and you know, I was fond of telling people it's the only Greek organization I've ever been a part of where nobody seems to fight. Pretty, pretty amazing, <laughs> you know. And that's, a lot of that that's true. Your your leadership. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining in. Um, we will uh, make. Chad's uh, information available on our YouTube and on Facebook. And we just want to thank you and have By a great the way, can, can I just give one other plug? Absolutely. So, so there was a, a seminar on the future of medicine in, in um, Naples. I was asked to come down and give a talk about stem cell treatment. Um, and that's, it's being edited. It was Emmy Award, many people producing it. It's going to be coming on, maybe on Netflix. It was a Netflix crew that was down there, maybe on Netflix, maybe on Amazon Prime. Wow, great. But Future of Medicine, um, Health Link, and um, there's, I'll be on there. There's some people talking about functional medicine, whole other topic, but about sort of doctors that use natural yeah. methods, so. And, and Chad, for people that want to check out some of these papers you mentioned, what are some of the journals or some of the academic place research, where can they go access this type of information? So or what, go, do they go, what do they Google, I should say? So if you go to, um, there's something called PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. This is the National Library of Medicine database. So for people who don't know, peer reviewed journals, you, you need to put things in peer reviewed journals, but there are a lot of not good peer reviewed journals. So PubMed, the National Library of Medicine, um, has standards for journals that they will index. So we publish in PubMed indexed peer-reviewed journals. If you just Google PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, G, 
just that. You'll get to a website. When you go to the website, it's got a search engine. And in the search engine, if you put my name, you'll get our papers. If you just Google, you know, Chadwick for Dromos MD, the papers come up that way too. A lot of other stuff comes up. But if you go to PubMed, um, or if you go to our website, the, the, the forum, the, the foundation website has papers up there. But just Google me at PubMed and these papers come up. Thank you so much, Chad. You have a great night. Kiss all the girls in your life for me. And, and, uh, and we'll see you soon in hopefully Las Vegas. Yeah.